Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations about art, literature, and creativity. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 104. Today's guest is Lilium Rivera. Hey there, folks. Welcome to the show. Today's guest is YA author Lilium Rivera. Lilium Rivera is an award-winning writer and author of the young adult novels Dealing in Dreams, published in March 2019, and The Education of Margot Sanchez, published in February 2018, and the forthcoming middle-grade novel Goldie Vance, The Hotel Whodunit, out in March 2020 from Little Brown. Her work has appeared in The Washington Post, The New York Times, and Elle, to name a few. Lilium lives in Los Angeles. Now, I first became acquainted with Lilium's work when I heard that she was coming to San Diego for a reading, and I tore through both of her books. What I love about them is the way that they center the voices of young women of color, which is something I never got to see when I was a teenager, and something that I absolutely love about books today. A couple of notes before we get started. Toward the end of the first segment, you'll hear a bit about Lilium's newest book, which is forthcoming this fall. The title and cover were just recently announced, and it's called Never Look Back, and I've included a pre-order link in the show notes. You can also find links there for both Margot Sanchez and Dealing in Dreams, which I highly recommend. Finally, Lilium has a few appearances and events coming up. On February 16th, she'll be participating in the It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere reading, which is at Mandrake Bar in L.A., On March 6th, she will be attending the North Texas Teen Book Festival in Irving, Texas. And on March 14th, Lilium will be at the Southeastern Young Adult Book Festival in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. You can find all of the details on Lilium's website at liliumrivera.com slash events, and there's a link in the show notes for that. All right, let's get started. Here's my conversation with Lilium Rivera. We actually, so we met in person um, the first time uh, here in San Diego uh, last summer at the last exit thing. And I had mentioned this to you then. I had just at that time just read Dealing in Dreams and I told you then that I really enjoyed it. And that was actually, that reading was where I bought my copy of uh, Margot Sanchez, which I've now had the pleasure of reading a couple of times. And I, so I just wanted to say again, though, how much I really enjoyed both of those books. Oh, thank you so much. That was, you know, that was really fun reading. It was just a, a different group of readers. Um, and I loved that. And I felt like everybody was really great. And it was such a good vibe. And the room was cool. You know, it was it was a good it was a good day. It was a good Saturday. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was a really uh, sort of eclectic reading too, poetry and prose and all kinds of good stuff. Um, anyway, so I, like I say, I really enjoyed both of these books. And one of the things, I, you know, I wanted to start with what might be kind of a prosaic question, but I'm, uh, hopefully it will, it will lead somewhere <laughs> interesting. I'm sure you've been asked this many times, but sort of the first thing I wanted to ask you was, what is it about YA or about sort of writing towards or uh, writing a, a younger characters that attracts you? Oh, yeah. Um, I love writing young adult books and middle grade. Because I just love that, that young, that just like, I've said this before, but I, I really feel like that age frame is like the discovery of first. It's like the discovery of your first kiss and discovery of shame of your sexuality, all those things. And, and I really love capturing that, even though it fills me with anxiety and angst. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do like writing those kind of like writing the, in that voice. Um, I think it comes easy for me mm. for the most part. So whenever I was writing fiction, I, I always started off writing in like a 16 year old. That was always like the age that I would start writing. Yeah. You mentioned there just, just now that it fills you with anxiety. What, 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 what is that? What's the anxiety about? Oh, it's because you're just reliving these really anxious horrible first experiences Mm. you know and so when you're writing that stuff you just try to embody that you know what that person is going through and and it could be really traumatizing yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) it really could it's just traumatizing to write (laughs) it is the kind of thing you know it's such a time of life that is such a uh, you know all everything is very heightened and intense or at least that's how I remember my adolescence, um, both, you know, my own feelings and all the things that were going on around me. Everything just feels so huge at the time. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. It's like a big, like everything is, 
extreme. Yeah. And the thing that, that, you know, if there was one thing that sort of characterizes maybe the way that I see looking back at my own youth is this way that at the time, I really felt like I knew what was going on. You know, like I felt like I was knew what was going on in my world, in the world with the people around me. I felt like I knew how things worked and that I was very mature. But then when I look back on it now, you know, 30 years later, I, 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 I realized that I was very naive at the time. Mm. And there is this interesting thing. I feel like reading these books as an adult, I mean, you know, they're YA, so they're intended for a younger audience. Right. But I find it an interesting experience to go back and read them as an adult, because I feel like you can still kind of see that in these characters. It's captured really well that way that things feel very like the characters of Margot and Nala, they feel like they know what's going on, but then as the book mm. progresses, they're, they're really shown how they don't, but then it's also done in this way. That's, it's not condescending, you know? And I thought that was, right. that was really interesting and, 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 it, um, skillful, you know? Thank you. I mean, I, I think for both those characters, they really are kind of walking around blind, mm. <laughs> you know, blindly walking around and just sort of accepting their reality. And then both of them eventually see the truth to me. And that, and that's like the biggest thing for me when I was growing up is just, yeah, it's accepting my reality, my reality being, I was growing up in the South Bronx and the housing project and we were broke all the time. But also just being aware, like seeing the reality of, of all of that, of class and of race and of, I don't know, addiction, all those things also became something that I was enlightened, like I was enlightened during mm. the high school, you know? Yeah. I think that there's this, you know, talking about class, it seems like both books are, are really, that class is a real central sort of um, theme in both books. And in particular, how uh, at the beginning of both novels, both Margot and Nala have this almost desperation to sort of associate with a higher class of people. Mm -hmm. And the way that, you know, these things all sort of thread throughout both of these books and how so much of both of them is driven by class distinction is something that I found really interesting and, and really like it was handled really uh, in a way that felt very natural mm -hmm. where both of them are given opportunities to learn things about these things, but in a way that never really feels didactic or heavy handed, you know? Yeah. Like I, I started it off with Margot Sanchez, that kind of that idea. And then I kind of went even a little bit deeper with Nala and this idea of buying into like the American dream, mm -hmm. you know? So I really wanted to play with that. <laughs> I really wanted to like push these characters into seeing how the system itself is flawed and that, that you can't just, you know, align yourself with people who have money and, and win, or you can't align yourself with people who, you know, who, who are at the, in the towers, you know, like all those things. So those are the things that I was trying to push this idea of like, once you see that the, the that the system is rigged, then I don't know. You figure out a different way of dismantling it. <laughs> yeah, it's such a tricky thing. I feel like, especially because, I mean, in the real world, that kind of attitude about wanting proximity to wealth and power is so present, you know. And I know, for example, like in the Asian American community, I'm Asian American, and it's it's the kind of thing that I see a lot of times where certain Asian people will, I don't know, there, there's this way that buying into the American dream or the model minority myth or mm -hmm. things like that really play out in these very weird and complicated ways. And I saw a lot of that happening, especially you know, really in both of these books about how that sort of aspirational thing that I always see playing out in communities of color that, I, you know, at least the ones that I'm part of, is present in these books as well, you know? Yeah. Like that's just definitely something that I've, you know, even I, that I think about even to this day with my own kids, you know, like I have a 15 year old and I'm, and I've always had this idea of, you know, getting her the best, right. Getting mm -hmm. the best education, finding ways of doing that. And, and then sometimes 
sometimes that falls, like it fails because, you know, I might have put her in a school that was predominantly white and maybe had the best things as she was suffering, mm. <laughs> like suffering, like really suffering, you know, so it was just like trial and error. So I'm just so aware of that, like the 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 weight of of these young young kids and that whole responsibility of of succeeding at all costs. Yeah. You know, that just weighs on on so many young people. So those are the things I guess I was trying to write about. This thing that you're saying, you know, I mean I I, I have kids as well. My oldest is eleven. Mm-hmm. And it's an interesting thing because um especially thinking about Margot Sanchez you know, as you're reading it, the sort of relationship that Margot has with her parents and the ways that her parents are sort of trying to, you know, in, in, in the book, it feels like she feels very sort of boxed in by her parents. Mm. And that's something that I certainly remember feeling when I was a teenager. <laughs> but <laughs> right. at, at the same time, it's like, now that I am a parent, there's this interesting thing where it's like, I can't fully fault them in these, these characters for the way that they do these things. Like, it's like, when you see them being sexist or classist or, or, or talking about race in ways that are a little bit janky, that doesn't feel right. But at the same time, it's like the impulse that they have, uh, that they're expressing in this way that isn't great. Um, you can still kind of see that it comes from a good place or at least good intentions. And I thought that was also really interesting. I think it was just trying to understand the, the decisions that they made, you know, like, all those decisions, especially like Margot's parents, like they, you know, they left Puerto Rico at a, at a young age and how they were trying to make it in New York and be, and succeeding in some, you know, in a lot of ways, right? Like owning two supermarkets, that's a big deal, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so like, I didn't want it to be such an easy, like, oh, they're the enemies because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just the, it's a matter of like, these are the decisions that are made and these are dreams that are, that maybe they haven't even fulfilled yet, you know, and just really being, I guess for that moment, for a young person to see their parents as these flawed humans who had their own dreams and maybe those dreams were never fulfilled. Mm-hmm. You know? I did think that that was something that seemed to bear out all the way through that book with really all of the characters that, There isn't really anybody, even though there are sort of antagonistic relationships that happen that sort of drive some of the action of the plot, nobody is like really fully a villain either, right? Like Mm. there are even ways where, I don't know, there are little connections that that get made here and there. Like um, the older brother is obviously up to some bad stuff, but he also wants to take care of his sister, the sort of um, condescending, rich, white girlfriends that she has from her school or they can be pretty awful at times, but towards the end, they, it seems like they even get a little moment of, of connection when Margot sort of starts to actually assert herself. And I I thought, oh, that was really interesting that nobody is fully just completely irredeemably a bad guy, you know? You know, it's, I guess for me, it's really important for as much as I love writing these kind of like antagonists or these villains, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, that I, I really have to know, understand where they're coming from, you know, and why they're doing certain things. And in their own way, they're just, they're striving, right? They all want the same thing that Margot wants, especially the brother, I feel, is just like, how is he trying to compete and get seen by his father, you know, and be respected by his father? He'll do anything he can to, to do that, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, and then turning more towards uh, dealing in dreams, one of the things that I was thinking a lot about is is how, so this is like a, sort of a near future dystopian story. And that's a genre that, you know, near future or middle future dystopian YA has been very popular. I, I mean, I don't know if it goes before the Hunger Games, but certainly since the Hunger Games, there have been a lot of like really big blockbuster series what has always struck me about them is that those stories are very, very white. And so it was really sort of refreshing to have this story where, that centers, you know, people of color, a Latina uh, protagonist in the first person. Is It, it seemed like a really, uh, you know, important kind of thing to do for representation, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I, for me, I, I just, it really was important for me to just write, um, a dystopian world that was populated by with brown and black people 
Mm -hmm. only (laughs) for the most part. And so then that was just key, you know, because the future is, will be, you know, brown and black. So I was just like, this is what I want. I want to write that kind of a story. Like what kind of a dystopian world would I create? And the, and I grew up reading all those kind of dystopian stories when I was in high school. Um, so I wanted to make something that I would have ended up loving to read. It's like, you know, if I had the choice. <laughs> yeah. It's something that I know I'm, this is something I've, I've said on the program several times before, but it's just, you know, I didn't have the experience of seeing certain aspects of um, my experience as an Asian person in fiction uh, until I was in my thirties. And, and it was something that I didn't really know that I was missing until I saw it. And, you know, like you say, we grow up reading uh, some of these types of same types of stories, but we're always forced to identify with people that don't really have experiences that are that similar to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just seems like a really valuable thing to, to be able to, um, to be able to have stories especially stories that are aimed at younger people that include more, you know? Yeah, no, it was really, it was a lot of fun to write this, to write dealing in dreams. And it was also, it really was like, sort of like I, I, you know, I read the, you know, Clockwork Orange when I was in high school and that really made such a huge impact on me when I was young. And I related to that story on so many levels, even though it was written way before me my time and it had nothing to do with brown kids or anything like that, but I related to it. So I was just like, this, this is the kind of stuff that I wanted to write, you know? Yeah. So in this, in this book, um, the main character is a member of this girl gang, right? Is and these are sort of the enforcers in their city that sort of are 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 how the person at the top is sort of exerting control over all of the sort of working class people, right? Um mm. and I I thought it was a really interesting thing. You know, when I look around and see um both critical and reader reactions to this book, a lot of them sort of uh, and very understandably sort of take this, this setting where these girls are, you know, going to beat downs and, and all this stuff and, and being like, seeing that as empowering, right. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. being like, yeah, they're so badass and that's so great. And on the one hand that, that makes a lot of sense to me because it, you know, like I said, that's not something that, um, historically, certainly not like, in the nineties or eighties or before was something that I would have seen in, in a lot of um, fiction and especially YA fiction. Right. But at the same time, I feel like this story is really sort of interrogating that, you know, you know, the, the utility or morality of violence as well, you know? Mm -hmm. And I thought that Mm -hmm. was really interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's that idea of, uh, of yes, of like the empowerment of, using violence, you know, of not being ashamed of it. And obviously these girls aren't, they, you know, they've lived in that world mm-hmm. of, of using violence to get their way. And, um, and it's a, and then it's a world where women have the only say, right. Mm-hmm. But I was really interested in, in that idea of, of that not working <laughs> in the long haul, you know, because it was really, you know, who it's that idea of like, of, of using Brown and black people to go off to war, you mm-hmm. know, like I keep thinking of my uncle who was a Vietnam vet and, and he went and fought that and he just came back destroyed by that, by this idea of here he is a Brown person Puerto Rican living in the Bronx and goes off to another, like completely other world to kill another Brown person. You know, it was just not, does not compute, compute, you know, Mm -hmm. and then come back and still be in the same rut, you know? Yeah. So it's just that idea of like creating soldiers and who's, who's creating these soldiers. And for Nala and her crew, they fed into that dream of like, well, if I keep doing this and I'm going to make it, you know, if yeah. I keep fighting, I'm going to make it. You know, when I think about th- that character and sort of the contrast between 
um, the world that she grows up in and that she sort of represents um, at the beginning of the book. And then the, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Ashe writers. Oh, yeah. How they live in the community and sort of society that they have built up outside of Megacity. Right. To me, it really, it really highlights sort of how, you know, an ego or system built on violence and control is ultimately one that's very fragile. To me, that was, that was one of the sort of big themes of the book I felt. Um, and that I, it feels like especially, well, I was going to say especially now, but I'm not sure that's correct. But I think that maybe we're having that conversation now more than we used to. I think it was like always an applicable idea, but maybe the world might be a little bit more ready for that idea now, or at least I mm. hope so. What do you, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> right. I mean, I don't know. Like I, I feel almost like Nala in the sense that she's not sure which works, mm -hmm. you know, like she, she thinks this idea of her, you know, the Alshay writers and their way of life makes sense, but she's as cautious as she is with everything. Right. So that's sometimes that's how I feel too. Cause I'm like, everyone is so, so easy to make these blankets, these statements that are like, well, if we had a woman president, it would be all great. And I'm like, I don't think that's true <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, well, it's just like with, um, with all of these things, right? Like how even, you know, uh, women can uphold patriarchal, um, ideas of society and people of color can buy into racism. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. 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 It's uh, so it's, it, I, I guess for me, it's, it's really exciting, I guess, for, for Nala to be able to like finally see the possibility of, you know, to sh maybe shape her future and maybe that future can just be a little bit different. Mm. So um, before we wrap up this segment, I wanted to touch on the, you know, I've heard you mention it a couple other places and then I looked and saw that it's uh, scheduled to come out this fall, but your, your next book, Fias and Yuri. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, it has a new title, but it will be announced soon. Okay. But yeah, it comes out in the, in the fall. So can we talk a little bit about that? Sure. So it's a young adult book. It's coming out September 2nd um, through Bloomsbury. And it's a retelling of the Greek myth Orpheus and Eurydice. And you have a Fierce, who's a bachata, wanna, a wannabe bachata singer who falls in love with Yuri, who's a displaced Puerto Rican, displaced from Hurricane Maria. And she's um, dealing with uh, PTSD. Uh, because of the Hurricane Maria, and also she's um, she an angry spirit is following her. Mm. So it you know it talks about trauma, generational trauma, and um, mental illness, and you know and Latinas um, really just trying to write about that that aspect of you know Latinas have a really high rate of of suicide. And, um, and it's something that I had written about a long time ago for a magazine. And it's something I've always thought about. So I wanted to, and also whatever, you know, what happened in Puerto Rico with Hurricane Maria and the government and its lack of, of help and aid, I kept on thinking about how it affected young people there. So I wanted to, for me, it was just my way of, of dealing with, with how that affected my own family and and trying to write about it. And so I picked um, the framework of this myth to do so. Hmm. It's, it's an interesting thing. You know, when I heard about this project, one of the things that it, it came to mind, and I, I don't know how this will strike you, but um, is it made me think of Hamilton. Ah, interesting. Because, you know, so much of the project of that musical is, is explicitly about, you know, taking this sort of central myth of a culture and inserting people of color into it. Mm -hmm, and I, mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. And so here, uh, Orpheus and Eurydice story is one of the Greek myths, but you're taking that story and populating it with contemporary people of color. To me that there's like an aspect of like, I can't think of the word. It's not appropriation, but it's like the opposite of that, you know, where it's mm -hmm. like, but it, that it is an act of power to take a, to take that and a story and 
do something like that with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think from, I think with the Greek myth, um, I was introduced to that myth through the movie Black Orpheus, Mm. which was, um, I think, a 1960s, late 60s, 70s um, set, you know, so the Orpheus uh, myth is set in Brazil during Carnival. Mm -hmm. To me, and so I saw that movie when I was really young, and I loved it. And, and it was like one of like, I, I loved it so much. I loved the music. And, and the story itself, it was just a beautiful love story and sad. And so that was really where I was coming from when I was thinking of retelling the, the myth. I was coming from that aspect of, of Orpheus. And I also wanted, because I was coming off of Dealing in Dreams, which is about violence, I wanted a love story. Mm. <laughs> Even though, you know, this love story might be just as horrific <laughs> and violent, I needed a love story that that between two Afro-Latino young people, because mm-hmm. um, I think we need that. We need, we need love, like young people need love stories for sure, you know, more, more mm-hmm. so. So that was where I was coming from is like that idea. And, and, and again, it was, it was really a way for me to tackle these traumatic things that were happening to Puerto Rico and find a way of, of dealing with it through fiction. Yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. Well, why don't we take a quick little break and then we'll come back and do the second segment. Okay. So for the second segment, I always invite the guests to bring a topic of their own, which could be whatever you'd like to talk about, anything that happens to be on your mind. So what would you like to talk about today? Oh, it would be silly for me not to talk about all the drama that's been happening with American Dirt. Oh, yes. And, um, the book that just came out, that's an Oprah pick. Um, yes. and that's Yeah. <laughs> and that's like, um, and it's been lauded as like um, an honest betrayal of what the border is like. <laughs> I think I've just been raging about it for the past few days. I, What's upsetting to me more so about all of this is this idea of someone who could just be like a whole group of people are just unaware of how disgustingly disturbing their betrayal is of, you know, their betrayal, even if it is in fiction and just not really listening to the Latino community who is talking about it and, and, and raging against it as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had heard about this. Um, one of my friends who I actually, uh, had on the show last year, uh, his name is David Bowles. Oh uh, yeah. Of course I know David. Yeah. He's been talking <laughs> quite vociferously about this for, <laughs> for a while now. Um, so that's how I sort of came to know it, but you know, just in case the listeners aren't too, uh, familiar with this one, can you sort of intro it like talk about what, what the book is and, and sort of why people are, upset about it sure i mean the the book just came out uh it, the author is um apparently a puerto rican and um and i say apparently because she i think she had associated herself as being white mm-hmm. just recently you know like maybe a year or two ago and so she got a seven figure deal to publish this book about this family who crosses the border and violence and all this stuff great you know she gets a seven figure deal um what the way i found out about the book was through the author miriam gurba g u r v a and she was enlisted to write a review for miss magazine and when she read the book and saw how it kind of just um it's all written in these horrible stereotypical cliches um, that are very disturbing. She wrote a, you know, a scathing review of, of it and um, Miss Magazine decided they didn't want to publish it. And so Miriam published the review in full in her on her blog. And that was really where, when I found out about the book, which was like about a month ago, mm-hmm. you know, I make note of that, right. I'm like, okay. And I know I'm not going to promote that book. Or I'm not going to, you know, but then the book was picked for Oprah, for Oprah's book of the month. And then all these celebrity, Latino celebrities started p- promoting it too. And I'm just like, what is happening? Yeah. 
So yeah. it just brings up all these things about work. You know, I, I'm really lucky. I got book deals. I feel blessed in a lot of ways, but I work really hard for all of those things. And still, I still, there's so much I struggle with, you know, and then you have this one person who's really feeding this white savior narrative to the masses and she's getting a seven figure deal and Oprah thinks it's great. Yeah. So it just plays on this, the inequality of who's, who gets to tell their stories, who's getting all the money behind it, you know? Yeah. It's the kind of thing that inevitably when these kinds of things happen, the narrative on one side of it is like, well, I'm an artist and this is, I don't think this is exactly what the author has said, but I know like this is just what ends up becoming the discourse, right? As people mm. are, will say artists should be allowed to write whatever they want and it shouldn't be off limits for a white person to write a story about people of color. And mm. I think what gets lost in that is, you know, of course, of course that's true. Mm -hmm. Like white people can write about people of color. It's just that if you do a bad job of it and you do things that are, you know, that people in that community are saying this is harmful to us, then you got to kind of own up to that. Right? right. Yeah. I mean, I totally, I totally agree with that. Like, it's just, I'm obviously I'm writing outside of my own race. I'm not going to continuously write about Puerto Rican young girls in the Bronx. You know, that's, that's not what I, I'm doing. And so then, but I have to make sure I get it right. Even, even a, an aspect of me writing about a girl in Puerto Rico from Puerto Rico, I have to make sure that I, I get that right. Like I've hired editors to read it. I interviewed people who lived through the hurricane Maria. I mean, even with, even though I have family who went through it, <laughs> I still made sure that I, I was trying to write it as emphatically as possible and as realistically as possible. Right. So yeah, to me, write whatever you want. You know, but if you get it wrong, <laughs> then listen, why you're getting it wrong. Listen to that because this is really harmful. It's really harmful. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing, of course, that, that's very disappointing is that, you know, there are uh, Mexican and Mexican American people, writers who have been writing about these very issues for a long time. And yet they're not the ones getting seven figure deals, right? Like they're not right. the ones who get to benefit from their own stories. It's only people from outside of that community who are allowed to be elevated and given, you know, and made wealthy by mm. these stories. And that it's just so, such an upsetting thing. I, I think what bothers me more so is that because people will buy this book and, and have it in their home and feel that they're doing something right, that they're helping the border, you know, kids in the border or families in the border or anything just by buying this book. And in actuality, they're just perpetuating this harmful, harmful stereotypes, you know, mm -hmm. that can, that doesn't help anyone. Right. So it's just that feeling of like, oh, look, I did something when you're really doing nothing. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, you know, that, that sort of brings up for me. I remember... So there's a, a poet, um, I don't know if you know her, sh her or her show. Her name is Rachel Zucker and she has this mm -hmm. show called Commonplace. It's, it's really, you know, anybody who's listening, like it's one of my favorite shows, uh, podcasts in any genre. Um, but she had this really interesting conversation with a man named John B. Wen. Um, I want to say last year or possibly the year before. And he runs this, uh, the Center for Documentary Studies at, some university that is either in North Carolina or Virginia. Mm. And they make this, they made this uh, series of podcasts about um, the first one was uh, called seeing white. And it was all about, you know, race in America and, and whiteness. And then the other one was called men and it was about masculinity and things like that. Anyway, that's probably too much backstory. But <laughs> the point <laughs> is like they had this really interesting conversation that sort of centered around people who are listening to these things uh, and, and, and I listened to both of those series and they, I found them both very, uh, like excellent and really interesting and really informative about like how race is constructed and how masculinity is constructed in like the whole history of all of it. They were, they were great, mm. but it, there's this thing where, um, they were talking about this, where people can listen to that. And on the one hand, it's good because you can listen to that and feel like, you know, and you learn something, but also the listening to it 
makes people feel like they've done something. Right. And it kind of bears on this because it's like, even I, I do kind of wonder, like even, even a book that is not um, horribly stereotyping and appropriative and all of these other things, there's this sort of aspect where it's like, probably some people do feel like, well, I read this book. And so that means I'm helping. But, yeah. But that's probably not actually enough to make change in the world. Right. Like, it's just, you know, I'm sure, you know, Oprah's gonna do some, some sort of tape or a special, you know, go to the border and, and maybe they'll, maybe it'll move people to donate. I don't know. It's just that, but it's just that feeling of like, yeah, like I, oh, I did something. Look, I read this book. Yeah. <laughs> I took a picture with it. I put it on Instagram. I'm great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so full of empathy now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so a, disturbing. It I is. think it's an act. Like we're all performing in some sort of Instagram algorithm or something. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know, I feel like there is like a little bit of a dilemma for, uh, for creative people because it's like, um, and I know like this is something that you've talked about, um, how you know, social justice is very important for you. I feel like there is this sort of dilemma maybe as creators where I do feel like we are doing something by making work that, you know, showcases these issues and, and talks about these issues. And we're doing something in, in a number of ways, both by allowing people who are experiencing these things to, you know, see themselves reflected in, in stories and, and feel less alone, but then also people who aren't experiencing these things can maybe learn something about it. At the same time, it's like, is writing or, you know, I'm a photographer, is taking photographs, is that um, the same thing as activism? It's something I struggle with a lot, mm, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. I and mean, that was the conversation I was having right before I got on here with my agent, right? It's the struggle of like, you know, I want people to learn about what happened to Puerto Rico, what's happening in Puerto Rico, and... And then yet I'm, am I, am I the right person to deliver that message mm. when there are people in Puerto Rico who can write about it themselves, you yeah. know, and then, and also am I peddling this trauma, you know, to young, to young kids. So I struggle with that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, in the context of this conversation that we're having, where it's like, I mean, you are actually Puerto Rican, right? Like, uh, I mean, you're, you're from New York, but like you are like part of the, uh, New York Rican, Puerto Rican community, right? Like, it's not like you are going totally outside of your, outside your lane, I guess. Right. 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 But even I'm, you know, and this is something that I saw even, you know, another author who's Puerto Rican too say the same thing you know, is that, that struggle, that struggle of who, who gets to tell the story. And, um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and this, all of this has been brought up because of, of what's happening. Yeah. with American. I mean, it is so disappointing because there are all those quotes that are going around about that author saying like, you know, she was wondering, she was, wasn't sure if she was the right one to tell that story, but then she went ahead and did it anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, uh, <laughs> I guess I, I, I'm trying to really think about the stories I want to write, you know, and it's, it's, I'm not going to lie that it's been a struggle these past couple of weeks just to really think about the next book I want to write and what I want to say, mm. you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. I think, especially for people living in diaspora, the relationship that we have to sort of our, our ancestral culture is sort of necessarily fraught. You know, it's not, it's not quite the same, you know, for somebody like me, for example, my, um, my parents were both born in California and three of my grandparents were born in California and two of my great grandparents were born in California. So, I am Japanese American, but you know, there is a way that like, I do wonder sometimes like what, what 
part of the Japanese or ja or even Japanese American uh, experience is really mine to work with. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, like, I don't really know if there's a good answer to that, but I do feel like wrestling with that question is something that is the responsible thing to do. Right. 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 You know, I mean, obviously, I mean, that is the thing with this author is that she, even in her own author's note would say she wishes she were brown, a browner person, you know, that's just such a weird <laughs> thing that, to say. <laughs> I know. And that's like, if you say that, maybe you shouldn't be writing this story. <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm just so disturbed by that, but <laughs> It's a, but hey, seven figures, right? Yeah, I mean, get your money, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. It's bringing up a lot of different things. It, it, it sure is. And, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see how this pans out. If it pans out at all. I mean, you know, the publishing house wants to get their money's worth, so I'm sure they're not going to back down anytime soon. <laughs> so, while that's happening, uh, you know, at least for the for most of the Latino commun literary community, they're not backing down either yeah yeah and it's important to to talk about these things i mean it's like it's like you know just like we were saying before you know like you can't expect just because you're an artist that that means that people can't talk about the thing that you're doing i mean that's really what freedom of speech is right is is mm. being able to criticize things right exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> so there is um there's one question that i like to end with and that is if there is a piece of art or literature or creativity in some form that you've experienced recently that meant something to you. Oh, um, yeah, I, I watched, I watched the movie burning. Hmm. It's a uh, Korean film. It was really slow moving and quiet and disturbing. And it talked a lot about class hmm. and, um, it was a great film to watch after watching Parasite. Yeah, I've seen Parasite, but I, I actually don't know this movie, is it? I mean, yeah, it's called Burning, and now I'm like obsessed with the director because now I want to see all his film. But his stars with um, Steven Yoon, mm. I think that's how you say He's in it, and and it's by Lee Chang. Mm. Mm -hmm. Lee Chang Dong. Um, yeah, it's a really great film, and just again, t like sort of having that same conversation about class in a different way. And I was like, I was kind of blown away by it. And now I've just been thinking about that film. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. I really appreciate it. I had a good time. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm glad that we were able to finally get this done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, as I mentioned at the top of the show, there are links in the show notes to where you can purchase copies of The Education of Marco Sanchez and Dealing in Dreams, and to where you can pre-order Never Looking Back. Coming up in February and March, Lilium has readings and appearances in L.A., the North Texas Book Festival, and the Southeastern Young Adult Book Festival. You can find all of the event details on her website at liliumrivera.com. And that is our show. Editing and mixing on this episode was done by me. The music is by Poddington Bear, and transcription help on this episode is by Shea Aguinaldo. You can find all of the show's social media information, transcripts, email newsletter, and show notes at keepthechannelopen.com. And if you'd like to support the show, you can make a pledge to our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash likewisemedia. A $5 monthly pledge gets you access to our bonus audio archive, which includes readings from guests of Keep the Channel Open and interviews with the authors of Likewise Fiction. Coming up next week on Likewise Fiction, I'll be reading J.Y. Young's Auspicium Melioris Ivy, a science fiction story in which famous world leaders are cloned and trained in a strange academy to be sent out as advisors to governments. What happens when one of the clones, the 50th copy of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew, tries to buck the system? Find out in Episode 9 of Likewise Fiction, which airs on February 17th. You can find that at likewisefiction.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Keep the channel open. We'll be back on February 26th when Brandon Taylor will be returning to the show to talk about his new novel, Real Life. Until then, remember, keep the channel open. Keep the channel open.